It was called Paukenschlag, or drumbeat in English, the German operation to extend the U-boat war to the very shores of the United States. When Hitler declared war on the US on the 11th of December 1941, following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th, the Germans decided that it was time to extend the U-boat war west, where defences were ill-prepared and patchy and hunting opportunities numerous. Since the outbreak of war in September 1939, German U-boats had been trying to starve Great Britain into submission by sinking the merchant ships, bringing the beleaguered nation food, raw materials, weapons, and many other essentials from the United States and Canada, and from certain South American countries, particularly Argentina. If Hitler could sever Britain's transatlantic trade, the nation's resistance to him would collapse. Initial successes had begun to fade, as the Royal Navy rapidly developed anti-submarine forces and better convoy protection in the eastern half of the Atlantic. But to attack the Allied supply ships at or near to source along the US and Canadian eastern seaboards where defences were weak could yet break Britain's resolve, and so Operation Drumbeat was formulated and put into action. It would also demonstrate to the Americans the long reach of Hitler able to send U-boats right to the shores of the United States. From January 1942, German U-boatmen would experience what they called the second happy time, the first being the slaughter of merchant ships at the start of the war in Europe, as long-range U-boats prowled the North American eastern coasts, sinking virtually at will an astounding 609 ships, totaling just over 3 million tons, for the eventual loss of just 22 U-boats. Due to the parlous state of U.S. defences, U-boats became very bold and came close inshore, in one famous case actually right up to New York Harbour, to torpedo and sink ships within sight of the skyscrapers of Manhattan. This is the story of how a German U-boat came within touching distance of America's biggest city in a bold and skillful display of seamanship. For the first phase of drumbeat, the head of the U-boat service, Admiral Karl Dönitz, could only spare five long-range submarines, as his forces were already fully engaged in the eastern and mid-Atlantic on anti-convoy duties. Among the five boats which left Europe on the 23rd of December 1941 for America was the Type 9B U-123. One of the largest U-boat types, 194 examples would be completed during the war. The 9B was 251 feet, or 76.5 metres in length, displacing 1,051 tonnes, with a range of 14,000 miles, or 22,000 kilometres, and a crew of 48, perfect for American operations. Armed with six torpedo tubes, four in the bow and two in the stern, U-123 was loaded with 22 torpedoes and also had a 10.5 cm naval gun for surface actions as well as 20 and 37 mm flak cannons for anti-aircraft defence. In command was an officer who would become a U-boat legend, Kapitän Leutnant Reinhard Hardigan. He had been in action since September 1939, previously serving as watch officer aboard U-124 and then as captain of the U-147 off the Scottish coast, where he had successfully sunk a Norwegian freighter. U-123 had already made several war patrols before Hardigan took over in May 1941. Patrolling off West Africa, Hardigan had sunk a neutral Portuguese freighter, and in October 1941 torpedoed and damaged the British auxiliary cruiser HMS Urania. For his patrol to America, Hardigan was ordered to take U-123 close inshore and penetrate the area around New York City, where large numbers of Allied merchant ships should be. Due to secrecy, the Kriegsmarine had no up-to-date maps of the area, Hardigan having to rely on his nautical charts and a pocket atlas being ignorant of U.S. defences. Hardigan was also not a well man, still suffering the effects of an air crash from 1936, as he had originally started out as a naval aviator before transferring to the U-boat branch. 
He had a shortened leg and chronic bleeding of the stomach that necessitated a special diet, but Hardigan was determined to take U-123 into action once again. By the 12th of January 1942, Hardigan had his boat 125 miles southeast of Cape Sable, Nova Scotia, when he attacked the Holt and Company steamship SS Cyclops, an old ship that had remarkably survived two torpedo attacks in World War I. Hardigan slammed a G-7A torpedo into her starboard side. The crew began to abandon ship, and 29 minutes later, Hardigan fired again, this time sinking the Cyclops. 46 passengers and one army gunner manning the ship's defensive weapons died. The rest of the crew was saved. Hardigan now approached New York. Operation Drumbeat commenced officially on the 13th of January 1942, with all five U-boats beginning attacks along the American coast. Motoring on the surface, U-123 moved towards New York City. Hardigan was delighted to discover that the Montauk Point Lighthouse at the tip of Long Island was still operational on the 13th of January, providing an excellent navigational beacon. Through powerful optics atop the Conning Tower Bridge, Hardigan and his officers could see many towns and settlements ashore fully lit up. Even car headlights could be discerned moving along coast roads. All this light provided a perfect backdrop to illuminate ships at sea to be targeted by the U-boats. At a point about 60 miles off Montauk Point, Hardigan came upon the Norness, a Panamanian registered motor tanker. On the 14th of January at 0834 hours, Hardigan slammed a torpedo into the tanker. A second struck the ship at 0853, finishing her off some 39 survivors being picked up by U.S. warships and a fishing boat. Later, on the evening of the 14th of January, Hardigan was close enough to New York to see the glare of Manhattan's skyscrapers in the distance. He later said, I cannot describe the feeling with words, but it was unbelievably beautiful and great. I would have given away a kingdom for this moment if I had one. We were the first to be here, and for the first time in this war, a German soldier looked upon the coast of the USA. A photographer aboard U-123 tried to get very good nighttime shots of Manhattan, and also film, but it proved difficult, as the lighting conditions were far from perfect. In fact, later propaganda films shown in Germany of this momentous event used images that were faked with carefully lit models, but the effect was very close to what Hardigan and his crew could actually see. Incredibly, Hardigan had actually visited New York City in 1933 as a naval cadet and climbed to the top of the Empire State Building. Now he was seeing these very buildings from the other side out at sea. Hardigan briefly considered entering New York Harbor to attack ships lying at anchor, but decided against this because of his lack of accurate charts. His U-boat could easily have been cornered and attacked in the harbour's shallow waters. Turning away reluctantly from the bright lights of Manhattan, U-123 motored away on the surface, again unthreatened by U.S. retaliation. The next day, U-123 struck again. At 0941 on the 15th of January, Hardigan attacked the unescorted British steam tanker Coimbra, 27 miles off the Hamptons on Long Island. The torpedo caused a massive explosion as the oil tanks blew up, clearly visible ashore. The tanker sank into shallow waters in just five minutes. Hardigan became bolder, next torpedoing the freighter San Jose only a thousand yards from the Coast Guard base at Atlantic City, New Jersey. By the night of the 19th of January, U-123 was off Cape Hatteras and would sink three more ships before heading back to base at Lorient in France. In a second war patrol to Florida, Hardigan successfully sank several more ships, earning him the Knight's Cross and Oak Leaves for these two operations, and also gaining him a congratulatory dinner with Adolf Hitler, during which Hardigan rather soiled his copybook by reprimanding Hitler for not forming a proper naval aviation branch like the Allies had. As a result of the first attacks of Operation Drumbeat, the U.S. Navy instituted convoys in U.S. waters. 
The U.S. Army ordered that coastal lights be doused or shielded to prevent U-boat commanders from using them to silhouette merchant ships to aid their attacks. Times Square was given a dim-out, that is, the famous advertising neon was switched off. After a series of training and staff appointments ashore, Hardigan ended up as a ground commander in 1945, in charge of a battalion of sailors fighting as soldiers during the final battles. After the war, Hardigan was a politician for over 30 years. Reinhard Hardigan died in June 2018. He was 105 years old. So, Germany had run a successful U-boat campaign off the American East Coast, but had been unable to attack the mainland. In fact, the only time Germany had assaulted U.S. soil was at the tail end of World War I, when a German submarine had shelled the small town of Orleans in Massachusetts. Hitler was desperate to see New York in flames to inflict material damage on America's premier city as he was doing to London, but how? The Luftwaffe possessed no aircraft with the range to reach New York and return. One possibility was to refuel bombers part of the way across the Atlantic at the Portuguese Azores. General Salazar had allowed German U-boats to refuel there. German aircraft manufacturers Heinkel, Junkers and Messerschmitt all designed aircraft for the mission to the US, all very large bombers. The distances involved were huge, a round trip of well over 7,000 miles. However, the designs proceeded on the assumption of using the Azores as a refueling point, reducing the round trip to about 6,400 miles from France. The winning design for the America bomber was the Junkers Ju-390. Two prototypes of this enormous long-range aircraft were built. The first, codenamed V-1, made its maiden flight on the 20th of October 1943. 26 aircraft were ordered but never built. The second prototype, V-2, was slightly longer. V-1 was personally shown to Hitler on the 26th of November 1943. It made many test flights until November 1944, when it was stripped of parts. In April 1945, it was apparently destroyed to prevent capture by the U.S. Army. V-2 began test flights in September 1944. It was equipped with air-to-surface radar and five 20mm cannon. The Ju-390 had six BMW engines with a crew of ten. Its wingspan was over 165 feet. As we will see shortly, the Ju-390 also had the fuel capacity and endurance to reach New York and return. A blow to the plan was struck in 1943 by the Portuguese Salazar. He decided to allow the Allies to refuel aircraft and indeed base them in the Azores. But with an increased fuel load and a much reduced bomb load, the Junkers Ju-390 still had the legs to make a round trip to New York from the French Atlantic coast. Just. Let's examine some of the aircraft's stats to see whether it is indeed feasible. About 53,000 pounds of fuel were required to provide takeoff power and then cruise at 12,000 feet for the 32 hours a round trip mission would take to New York. This was sufficient to permit a return flight with a 10,000 kilogram payload. It has been calculated that cruising at 232 knots, a Junkers 390 could theoretically fly 7,400 nautical miles. So, the intriguing question remains, did the Luftwaffe attempt to fly to New York and back? The answer is not clear and highly disputed. The first such claim emerged in November 1955 in a story that a pair of Junkers 390s had made an extraordinary transatlantic flight to New York, including lingering over the city for one hour. Another intelligence report stated that a Ju-390 had been delivered to a Luftwaffe unit near Bordeaux in January 1944 and had made a 32-hour round-trip flight to within 12 miles north of New York City. Other intelligence reports based on POW interrogations made the same claims, including the claim that the crew of one aircraft had photographed Long Island. These claims were made by experienced Luftwaffe pilots, though they provided no evidence and they provided no photographs that they had allegedly taken. 
Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and armaments minister, claimed that a Junkers 390 made a top-secret trip to Japan before the end of the war, which was entirely possible. We will probably never know the truth regarding the America bomber. The fall of France pushed the Germans away from the Atlantic coast, meaning any proposed America bomber missions to New York were scrubbed. In the final analysis, it remains one of World War II's great what-ifs. Attacking New York City was a minor obsession for the Axis powers during World War II. The huge city seemed to draw nefarious Axis plans to itself like moths to a flame. Ever since the United States entered the war on the Allied side in December 1941, Germany and Japan had hatched plans to bombard its coastal cities, and New York in particular, but without success. The Atlantic and Pacific Oceans proved formidable physical barriers to preventing such attacks, as the technology of the day was too limited to have any real effect on the US mainland. German U-boats sank tens of thousands of tons of Allied shipping off the American eastern seaboard in 1942, but the U-boats could not physically attack the mainland cities. The best U-boat skippers could do in the early days was to use the bright lights of New York City to help silhouette merchant ships at night. The Japanese took a different approach, managing to shell some U.S. installations on the west coast using the deck guns of their submarines. Some Japanese submarines were able to carry small floatplane aircraft, and two small bombing raids were made over Oregon in 1942, using incendiary bombs in an effort to set fire to the huge forests. Both attempts failed. Later, the Japanese tried again with hydrogen-filled paper balloons carried across the Pacific from Japan on the jet stream to automatically drop incendiary and anti-personnel bombs all over the western US and Canada. This campaign also failed to produce the desired results. In the meantime, the Germans conceived of the America Bomber Project to produce a huge class of heavy bomber capable of crossing the Atlantic and delivering a modest payload of high-explosive bombs onto New York City. The America Bomber Project was not seen through. But perhaps the plan with the best chance of success was not German or Japanese, but Italian. He was conceived by an extraordinary Special Forces officer who commanded one of the most respected and feared units in World War II. Prince Junio Borghese was a naval officer and hardened fascist supporter of Benito Mussolini's. A member of a prominent noble but non-royal family, he had become a submarine commander in 1933, seeing service in the Second Italo-Abyssinian War and the Spanish Civil War. When Italy entered the war in June 1940, Borghese was commanding a submarine, which was modified to carry a new invention that revolutionized underwater warfare, the Miali, or Pig, the first manned torpedo. The captain of the craft sat in the forward position. He handled the controls and did the navigating. Cruising range was 15 miles at a cruising speed of two knots. Borghese commanded several successful raids in the Mediterranean that used Frogman and Miali. The most famous was a raid on the British anchorage at Alexandria in Egypt on the 18th of December 1941. Three manned torpedoes badly damaged two Royal Navy battleships at anchor, HMS Valiant and HMS Queen Elizabeth. Borghese took command of the underwater commando unit called Decima Flotilla MAS, the 10th assault vehicle flotilla, recognized as the best in the world. So it comes as no surprise that Borghese, nicknamed the Black Prince, decided to extend operations from the Mediterranean to the United States. Borghese understood that a successful operation against New York Harbor would have a negative effect on American morale. It would bring the war directly onto American soil. Borghese's plan was simple. He would insert a special forces unit off Fort Hamilton, 
which with a new type of midget submarine and a force of commando frogmen would navigate up the hudson river and mine a series of merchant ships docked along west street in new york before withdrawing to safety because of the sheer distances involved, a large, ocean-going mother submarine would carry the attack equipment across the Atlantic. Borghese knew that he couldn't use manned torpedoes on such a raid. He needed vessels capable of longer-duration missions, able to protect the crews from weather, but still small and stealthy. He cast around for such a system. Fortunately, such vehicles actually already existed, and were in storage at La Spezia, Italy's main naval base. The CA was a type of midget submarine designed by the Caproni Aircraft Company. Two prototypes had been constructed in the 1930s, little two-man submarines, with ballast tanks, torpedo tubes, and they had been thoroughly tested by the Royal Italian Navy in 1938, the CA type proved excellent vehicles and further improvements were made. More testing was made at Venice, this time in salt water. The submarines could navigate on the surface at 7 knots and run at 5 knots submerged. The two 20-ton submarines were placed in storage at La Spezia until found two years later by Borghese's unit. But both needed complete refurbishment after so long in storage. Borghese also ordered some alterations. The torpedo tubes were removed and replaced by eight 100-kilogram explosive charges that could be affixed to enemy ships by frogmen. The diesel engine was also removed. Only the submarine's electric motor was needed. The conning tower and periscope were also deleted. The second crewman was changed from an engine mechanic to a frogman. The new CA craft had a range of 70 miles, and increased underwater speed to 6 knots, and could dive to 47 metres. Unfortunately, during further tests, CA-1, the first prototype, sank in Lake Ezio because of mechanical problems. Only one craft was now available for the mission, CA-2. But Borghese went ahead and moved to deal with the next problem, a large mother submarine to carry CA-2 to New York. The submarines already assigned to Borghese's flotilla were too small to carry CA-2 across the Atlantic. He decided to ask the German Navy for assistance, but Admiral Dernitz, commanding the U-boat forces, had no vessels to spare. This was a blow, as the available Italian submarines based in France were not numerous. At Bordeaux, the Italian Navy maintained a small fleet in conjunction with German U-boats. Prince Borghese approached the base commander for help and was assigned the Marconi-class submarine Leonardo da Vinci, commanded by an experienced skipper. On the 1st of July 1942, the Leonardo da Vinci had returned to Bordeaux after a successful Atlantic patrol, having sunk 20,000 tons of enemy shipping. The submarine was then sent to the local shipyard for modification for the coming mission. The forward deck gun and its base were removed, and a special cradle created to hold CA-2. Sea trials commenced on the 9th of September 1942, practicing releasing and retrieving CA-2. The process was repeated on the 15th of September, and Borghese knew that the mission was ready. But he would not launch it until December, as the operation required minimal daylight and plenty of night time to permit the frogmen time to mine ships in New York, and evacuate. Borghese also needed time to build up an intelligence picture of what was in the harbour and its defences. In fact, gathering information caused the raid to be postponed until December 1943. It is believed that Borghese may have delayed so long because he was awaiting the completion of two new CA-class boats, CA-3 and 4. But disaster struck on the 23rd of May 1943 when the Leonardo da Vinci, out from Bordeaux training, was detected and sunk by the Royal Navy destroyer HMS Active and the frigate HMS Ness. But an even greater calamity befell Borghese on the 8th of September 1943, when Italy signed an armistice with the Allies. 
Borghese fled north and with most of his unit continued to fight for the fascists until May 1945, before fleeing to Spain, where he died in 1974. Bordeaux was evacuated by the Germans in 1944 following D-Day and the Battle of Normandy, but CA-2 was abandoned. It was discovered in 1945 on a railway flat car in the French city. Intact, it was later scrapped. Could Borghese's operation have worked? Probably. If the Leonardo da Vinci had managed to evade Royal Navy and US Navy anti-submarine patrols to get near New York, the technology worked fine. CA-2 was a very capable machine, and her crew very well-trained professionals. Certainly, a series of merchant ships suddenly exploding on the New York docks would have sent shockwaves through America, and Borghese would have had his propaganda victory. But delays carry the operation beyond the Italian surrender, and we will never know what havoc the Black Prince could have wrought in New York City. January 1945, the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. A hunt is underway, a hunt for U-boats. But this is no ordinary hunt, for the Americans have credible information that the U-boats approaching their shore are no ordinary German submarines. Rather, these boats are rocket U-boats, about to unleash V-1 flying bombs on New York City. The Americans will use everything at their disposal to stop this diabolical German plan from being enacted. Mounting rockets on U-boats was not a late war idea. Rather, experiments in trying to perfect submarine launch weapons had been ongoing since as early as 1941. Peenemunde, on the Baltic island of Usedom, was where Germany developed its rockets and missiles in the first half of the war. Summer 1942 was the first firing of rockets off the deck of a U-boat, when a Schwieres Werfgerät 41 rocket launcher was welded to the deck of the Type 9C submarine U-511. Loaded with six 30-centimeter rockets, the U-boat conducted successful firing tests at the surface. Then it made a series of underwater launches down to a depth of 12 meters or 40 feet. The rockets worked fine and were unimpeded by being submerged. But though such tests proved that a U-boat could launch such weapons surfaced or submerged, the weapons themselves were effectively little more than dumb mortar bombs, the U-boat having no way of controlling the rockets as they lacked a suitable guidance system. The mortar system was intended to protect the U-boat from anti-submarine hunter forces, but it was too inaccurate to be of much practical use at sea. Further development of the underwater mortar was neglected as Peenemunde worked to perfect the first of Hitler's new V for Vengeance weapons, the V-1 flying bomb. The V-1 was an early cruise missile, powered by a single pulse jet engine. The V-1 was launched off a ramp using a steam generator. Guided by a simple autopilot that regulated altitude and airspeed, the V-1 carried a 1,000 kg explosive warhead. An odometer driven by a small propeller in the nose determined when the missile had reached the target area, and when the preset counter reached zero, the V-1 automatically placed itself into a steep dive to impact the target. Used to bombard London, these cheap weapons landed accurately within a circle initially 20 miles or 32 kilometers in diameter, corresponding to the entirety of London, later improved to 7 miles or 11 kilometers. 9,521 V1s were launched at England, with about 25% hitting targets, the rest falling to flak guns, barrage balloons, fighter interception, or mechanical failure. They killed 6,184 people and injured three times as many, and destroyed or damaged a million buildings. With the V-1 perfected, the notion of mounting V-1s on U-boats was suggested in July 1943. It was an attractive idea. With a range of 148 miles, or 238 kilometers, it would provide a U-boat with a standoff capability able to strike a target, not very accurately, from over the horizon. Because it was on a U-boat, it could be sent against any city in the world, and at the forefront of many minds was the idea of bombarding cities along the U.S. eastern seaboard, New York City being the most obvious target. Several V-1s, 
in a disassembled state could be stored aboard a U-boat as reloads. To launch a V-1, a ramp and a catapult was needed, and early development work commenced on designing a system that could be emplaced onto one of Germany's existing U-boat designs. But at the same time, German scientists were already thinking much bigger than the V-1, for the new V-2 missile had been created. The world's first long-range guided ballistic missile, the V-2, cost between 5 and 10 times the cost of manufacturing a V-1, but had a much increased operational range of 200 miles or 320 kilometers. could be launched by mobile units rather than in fixed locations vulnerable to air attack and was impossible to detect or shoot down as it plummeted onto its target and an astounding 1,790 miles per hour, or 2,880 kilometers an hour. These fearsome weapons bombarded London and South East England between September 1944 and March 1945. Over 3,000 V2s, killing about 9,000 people, injuring tens of thousands, and causing huge damage to property. With the deteriorating war situation for Germany by late 1944, using the V-2 against the United States, specifically New York City, again became a German concern. But unlike the V-1, the V-2 was a much bigger technical challenge. For one thing, its size alone meant that no existing U-boat was large enough to even carry one. Project Prüfstand 12 began development of a submarine cargo container that could accommodate one V-2 and be towed across the ocean to the U.S. coast by one of the new Type 21 Electro boats, a revolutionary new design of U-boat, years ahead of its time. It was envisaged that a single Type 21 could tow up to three of these submerged V-2 containers, each displacing about 500 tons. As well as a V-2, each container also held a reserve of diesel fuel to supply the Type 21 during its long journey, as well as all the complicated fuels and chemicals required to launch a V-2. Arriving at the firing point, ballast tanks in the container would be flooded, bringing the container to a vertical position. The guidance system would be set, and then the missile launched remotely from the mother U-boat. However, the technical difficulties in trying to adapt a V-2 for launch at sea were immense. The V-2's engine required a two-component fuel, which demanded careful and long control before launching. The missile could not be transported fully fueled, as the tanks would collapse if fueled in the horizontal position. The entire process of setting up, fueling and launching a V-2 on land was quite long and laborious requiring large numbers of vehicles and technicians. However, Germany pressed ahead with constructing the first underwater containers, each 30 metres long. Orders for three containers were placed at a shipyard in Stettin in December 1944, and a further order at another yard at Elbing in Germany. It appears that at least one container was completed, and testing started during the winter and spring of 1945 but the Germans never perfected the equipment before the war ended. But though the Germans never managed to perfect V-2 armed U-boats, Allied intelligence had information that such a program was underway, and understandably considering the Germans had been raining down V-1s and V-2s on London and South East England, fear that the project was actually more advanced than it was. The information that V-1 armed U-boats would be sent to attack New York City came from German spy Oscar Mantel, who was captured by the U.S. Navy when the U-boat transporting him to Maine was sunk in September 1944. Mantel told the FBI that V-1 armed submarines were being prepared for a mission. Aerial reconnaissance of U-boat bases in Norway revealed several odd mountings on U-boat decks, perhaps launching ramps for V-1s. Further analysis revealed that they were actually ramps for loading torpedoes. But then, a few weeks later, other reports of V-1 armed U-boats emerged, one via neutral Sweden. Although the British Admiralty believed that the Germans could launch V-1s from their large Type 9 U-boats, owing to the strategic situation, would the Germans waste time and resources on such small-scale attacks on America? The U.S. government thought so, and the Eastern Sea Frontier, a U.S. operational command defending the U.S. coast from Canada to Florida, was ordered in November 1944 to begin intensive anti-U-boat patrols up to 250 miles or 400 kilometers from New York City. 
Then, more confirmation arrived that further reinforced in U.S. minds the reality of the threat the nation faced. U-1230 successfully landed two German agents in Maine in December 1944. William Colpew and Erich Gimpel were subsequently captured in New York City. Like Mantel, the two agents reported that rocket arm U-boats were coming. Next, on the 10th of December, New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia went public with the threat, creating huge media interest in the story. Six days later, the massive German offensive came rolling through the Ardennes forest of Belgium and Luxembourg, through weak American defences, and an enemy who was supposed to be nearly beaten was instead beating back the Americans and advancing once again west. The U.S. Navy took the U-boat threat very seriously and prepared what came to be called Operation Teardrop, marshalling U.S. Navy hunter killer groups and U.S. AAF aircraft to destroy any U-boats that approached the American coast. The forces were ready by the 8th of January 1945. Shortly afterwards, German armaments minister Albert Speer made a radio broadcast in which he said New York City could expect V1s and V2s to fall by the 1st of February 1945, further fueling U.S. government concerns. Then, in March 1945, U.S. intelligence learned of the departure of nine U-boats from Norway headed for the North American coast. On the 12th of April 1945, the U-boat pack received the code name Gruppe Seewolf, and their purpose was to attack shipping from New York southwards to divert anti-submarine forces away from British coastal waters, where a fresh inshore U-boat campaign was planned. The Americans quickly concluded that Gruppe Seewolf were missile arm U-boats, and Operation Teardrop swung into action. A huge naval force, including two escort carriers and 20 destroyer escorts, sorted from the Hampton Roads. Twelve of the destroyers began searching in a line 120 miles or 190 kilometers long. Gruppe Seewulf found no targets as convoys had been diverted away from them. The boats' frequent radio communications with U-boat command in Germany enabled U.S. hunter forces to plot their movements with ease. First to be attacked was U-1235. Bombarded by the Hedgehog Mortar aboard the destroyer escort USS Stanton on the 15th of April 1945. The German submarine escaped but was reacquired by sonar and with USS Frost, Stanton destroyed it early on the 16th of April, all hands being lost. USS Frost then found U-880 by radar on the surface. Frost opened fire with Bofors 40mm guns, forcing U-880 to crash dive. In company with the USS Stanton, the destroyer escorts sank the U-boat with Hedgehog at 4am on the 16th of April, killing all aboard. Interestingly, both U-1235 and U-880 exploded with great force, reinforcing in American mines that the vessels had been carrying V-1 flying bombs. U-805 was caught by aircraft on the surface on the 18th and 19th of April, but not attacked. On the 20th of April, ironically Hitler's last birthday, U-805 launched torpedoes at a hunting U.S. destroyer escort, but missed. The night of the 21st, U-805 escaped after two hours of depth charging by three destroyer escorts. But on the night of the 21st to 22nd of April, the USS Carter detected U-518. Hedgehogged by Carter and another destroyer escort, U-518 blew up. There were no survivors. A more southerly search by 14 destroyer escorts netted more results. Realising the disaster that was unfolding, on the night of the 22nd to 23rd of April, U-Boat Command dissolved Gruppe Seewulf and ordered three of the remaining boats to take station between New York City and Halifax in Nova Scotia to interdict convoys. It also ordered three more U-Boats, which had been operating independently of Gruppe Seewulf, to join the others. Allied decryption of these signals told the Americans that the V-1 armed U-boats were preparing to launch against New York City. But, as the U-boats sailed to their new positions, interceptions were made. On the 23rd of April, an Avenger dropped depth charges on U-881, but the U-boats survived. 
Next day, U-546 maneuvered to try and torpedo the escort carrier USS Core, but was detected by the destroyer escort USS Frederick C. Davis at 8.30 a.m. U-546 immediately fired a T-5 acoustic torpedo at the U.S. ship, sinking her with the loss of 126 of her crew. U-546 was hunted relentlessly for 10 hours by eight destroyer escorts, the damaged U-boats surfacing. Her captain and 32 of the crew were taken prisoner. These prisoners were heavily and brutally interrogated ashore, including being beaten up to force information about German plans out of them. But no information about V1s was forthcoming, and the ill treatment continued until the end of the war in Europe. The fifth and last U-boat to be destroyed was U-881, depth charged to destruction on the 5th of May 1945. The surviving four U-boats surrendered at sea on the 7th of May 1945. No V-1s were discovered aboard any of the boats. The captains and certain members of the crews were all subjected to harsh interrogations. It will be recalled that the British Admiralty had believed that the Germans were capable of launching V-1 missiles off U-boats. And after the war, the US Navy actually made some practical experiments, firing the American copy of the V-1, the KUV-1 Loon, off the submarine USS Cusk in 1946. It was a slow process, taking about an hour to prepare and launch the rocket, but the US Navy proved that the German plan, with a few refinements, could have worked, and a few V-1s could conceivably have been launched at US cities. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.